uh, hello everybody nice to have you here uh, some of you already attended the first session uh, there are some new registered persons so uh, good morning to everybody uh, I see some um, friends here Leonardo good morning to you uh, Alicia ciao <laughs> and uh, um, there is there, there are many people uh, today connected from all over the world which is something very interesting and I found it very um, let's say in line with uh, uh, my uh, hopes actually because I really hoped that this uh, this uh, um, offers and webinars that I am uh, uh, creating in this pandemic situation uh, would gather this this kind of uh, of listeners so from all over the world I think it's uh, the first time uh, in modern history that there are billions of people stuck at home so it's nice to uh, to have some of you uh, connected to my to my webinar um i see many people from india uh italy uh united states belgium france spain bolivia egypt uh germany honduras Lebanon, lithuania mexico nigeria peru serbia the united kingdom vietnam austria uh brazil of course denmark canada so it's it's basically uh from all over the world thank you very much for being here um so uh yeah for for those of you who, who were already here uh last week um uh, you already know what we're talking about it's textile simulation with grasshopper and especially with kangaroo uh, for grasshopper um i am just just for those who are connecting for for the first time today uh i will just quickly go through uh, the same presentation that i the same slideshow that i uh, presented uh, last week so let me clear this whiteboard and hide the whiteboard just for a few seconds just to uh, summarize what we are going to talk about of course today we will not um, uh, let's say repeat the basics that we already saw last week I will just uh, let's say introduce um, a couple of, uh, of subjects and then we will uh, move to the uh, practical uh, examples that we will only discuss two examples uh, today uh, but they are going to be uh, quite interesting um, so yeah basically um, uh, you might know me already but I am a, a, a professor of, of digital design and digital fabrication at, at the University here in Mexico City and I'm also a lecturer I give a workshop and uh, master classes basically uh, all over the world actually well, not in this particular situation, of course, uh, but yeah, uh, up to, uh, let's say, last year, I was moving around a little. Um, these are some examples of uh, objects and uh, designs that were created using uh, parametric, parametric design, computational design, um, mostly from the industrial design uh, uh, undergraduate course. Uh, these are some uh, studies that I made for uh, for um, uh, study groups. Uh, this is from a paper that was presented at the IASS uh, conference in in uh, in Boston at the MIT in 2018, which was extensively using uh, Kangaroo uh, and of course Caramba 3D, as you can see here from these uh, components here. Um, this is my book, in case uh, you don't know it. Uh, it's not about parametric design. There is no uh, grasshopper. Well, actually, yeah, there is uh, a quick, uh, very small uh, example with grasshopper, but the book is on uh, nerve smothering with rhino. Uh, so there is no parametric design inside this book. But I repeat, I think that um, a perfect knowledge of uh, of nerves geometry, it's mandatory for those who want to uh, use grasshopper uh, like professionally okay um, and uh, as regards textile simulation um, this was basically the main image of the of this webinar uh, it's a, a a schematic representation of a textile made with this square uh, grid basically uh, but um, and I already told uh, last week that we are going to consider only the elastic phase uh, for the stress strain uh, relationship which is basically the elastic phase of the um, elastoplastic problem okay um, and we are going to use basically two models um, the simplified model which which was the one that I already showed you with with the square grids and eventually this second one uh, with diagonal uh, springs okay so you see that um, 
basically the, it, it is always a schematic representation but uh, according to this to the diagram that you want to uh, simulate in grasshopper you will get different behavior for your textile okay and you can create something like uh, this remember this is a rendering there is no uh, material information in, in kangaroo in terms of aesthetics it's just physics and this is another example that i made for a client uh, an italian client so let's jump uh, into uh, grasshopper let me um, stop the slide presentation and um let's jump to grasshopper i'm going to sh to share my my screen here it is and here we are okay uh last week we stopped here i have prepared a couple of scripts which are uh, these two uh i'm not going to just describe them i'm going to uh, recreate them from scratch uh, so that um, it will be easier to understand what are the, the different steps. And um, also, these two scripts are not intended only to, um, to work with Kangaroo. Um, they are intended also to understand how, for example, uh, data manipulation uh, can, can help and actually it's fundamental for any type of uh, um, script implementation in Grasshopper. So if you don't know or you, can, you are not um, exactly um, aware of, of uh, what data manipulation is and what what's the potential of uh, uh, manipulating data inside grasshopper i kindly invite you the, to um, to basically um, look around actually there is a uh, the webinar that i was giving last week not the textile simulation webinar but the data tree simulation the data tree webinar is already available on my youtube channel so I invite you to go on YouTube and uh, and look for this uh, webinar. It's uh, publicly shared, so um, and and uh, it's very. Uh, I think it's very complete for uh, as regards the 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 uh, data trees uh, understanding. Okay, um, so uh, one one thing that I wanted to uh, point out with respect to uh, the last uh, the last simulation that we did last week is that, for example, if we run uh, this simulation here, uh, remember it was just like some kind of textile hanging from uh, the, the upper edge, and we had this upper edge uh, capable of uh, moving up or down because we defined the target for our anchor points, okay? Now, of course, we, can, we could improve this simulation. Uh, for example, we could introduce uh, a floor here so this uh, this thing would simply stop falling as soon as it uh, collides with the floor and we could also introduce some some um, uh, collisions inside the simulation and and so on but um but actually these are very simple uh, components so for example in case we you want to introduce a floor it's just going into kangaroo 2 and uh, if this is something that affects the points of your system, so you're going to go point, take the floor, uh, put it here, and tell Kangaroo that there is also a floor. So you see that now this thing is falling, but it cannot pass through the floor. Okay, so it's something that helps having a a um, a, a more realistic simulation. Of course, you don't have this uh, textile hanging and stretching infinitely uh, towards the bottom. Okay. And also introducing some collisions, it's, uh, it's also very interesting because you can see the behavior of this textile while it collides with the other object. But um, in terms of, uh, of a real realistic aspect, for example, um, in order to have a, a quite a precise behavior for, for um, coll collisions with other bodies, you might want to increase the resolution quite a bit and the simulation is going to be uh, quite heavy. So. Um, just remember that uh, Kangaroo is, is a very good tool uh, for performing these kind of simulations. But if you want uh, some extremely realistic behavior, the best tool that I have found so far is Houdini. Okay, so in that case, you have a very very strong uh, physics uh, engine, and you can simulate basically whatever you want in terms of uh, soft bodies, rigid bodies, and uh, interactions. Okay, but anyway. Um, uh, the only, the thing that I wanted to to point out right now is another one. Is that uh, you you remember uh, well those who were who, who were here remember that this this script I'm going to share it 
on my YouTube channel together with the recording of this, of this webinar, okay? So, um, also, um, if you, uh, you will receive an email after the, the webinar, um, you're reminding that there is the recording available online, uh, but remember that um, the, the video will be available forever on my YouTube channel, while it won't be available forever in this uh, uh, webinar platform, okay? So I uh, invite you to, to go to my YouTube channel and stay tuned because this video, as well as this script, will be uploaded uh, on YouTube, okay? Um, so uh, what we did last, last week was to basically um, somehow differentiate the behavior of this, uh, of this textile because we were, all, we were using uh, two techniques. First one was using the edge length component. So the edge length component takes the original mesh and apply the same elastic properties to all, to all the edges. Okay, so each segment of this grid here is basically converting into the same type of spring. And also these edges are all, uh, they all have the same length because I was working with a square uh, surface. So uh, there is absolutely no difference between the physical behavior of this line here and the physical behavior of this line here, okay? And so if we use this uh, edge length as the elastic force in our simulation, so I plug this inside my switch, for example, then we will have a behavior. But what we did was to uh, separate um, using the, the uh, brace grid from uh, um, lunchbox uh, plugin, which creates this kind of grid inside our uh, surface, which is made by, by um, is made of square, uh, grid, square panels, basically with one diagonal line, okay? And so uh, this is something that um, uh, actually um, simulates this kind of structure here for the textile. So what we were doing here was work with the primary lines and brace lines. So primary lines are the square and brace lines are the, the uh, diagonals, okay? And we were giving them two different elastic properties. So this is the first set of lines, which are the squares, uh, where we give them a, a length factor of one, so they don't want to stretch or compress, okay? And then we have the diagonals, which are these ones, which they, they want to contract a little. Okay, so this means that we can um, differentiate the elastic behavior um, of each spring inside our uh, textile. So for example, if I have the simulation running, okay, and then I go here in this um, rest length uh, factor, basically, uh, which is actually the one that we are using in the kangaroo simulation, and I reduce this, you see that this object starts to, let's say, skew a little, okay? So as soon as the diagonal, which are from bottom left to upper right, start to uh, contract, okay? Uh, well, actually they are quite collapsing. So if I reduce this uh, to zero, you see that we get this kind of uh, contraction of the textile along the uh, bottom left, upper right diagonal direction, okay? And of course, if I use a value which is larger than one, then I have the, the exactly the exact opposite behavior because this uh, textile is stretching along the same diagonal. Okay, so uh, basically, we can differentiate the elastic behavior of uh, of this textile. Um, what's the use for it? Well, actually, we are not going to discuss this, but um, think about this uh, brace grid one to this one to one D structure. Sorry as a um, automatic method for separating a set of uh, edges from another set of edges, okay? So um, the thing is, once you have your mesh, let me turn off the simulation and reset it, okay? Once you have your mesh, which is this one, and you want to work with, uh, with its edges uh, uh, assigning a, a, an elastic property, um, you can program um, a differentiated textile behavior by dividing the set of edges into as many sets as you want. And in order to do this, I encourage you to use, for example, attractors, any type of attractors. So, for example, point attra concentrated attractor, which are point and curve attractors, or, for example, diffuse attractor like, um, like uh, images, for example. Uh, or also 3D attractors like vector attractors, okay? So in that case, you can separate the edges according to uh, specific logics that you might want to implement 
And then you will have a, a different behavior for the uh, several parts of your textile, which is something that, for example, I, I have used for, um, let's say, simulating uh, complex uh, textiles, like, for example, the one that you uh, use for sports gears, like uh, compression, uh, uh, compression, compression gears. Okay. Uh, so I, I will not be discussing this because it's just uh, applying attractors, which are uh, some basic grasshopper theory. Uh, and also there is a tutorial on, on attractors on my webs on my uh, YouTube channel as well. So uh, you might want to check uh, this tutorial uh, and uh, and you will see basically how to deal with concentrated attractors mostly. Uh, there is some reference to diffuse attractor and also to vector attractors, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. But um, I only uh, discussed the uh, concentrated attractor, so points and curve. But anyway, once you divide the, the set of edges into two sets or three or whatever, then you will be able to program the behavior of your textile accordingly. Okay. So what we are going to do uh, today is uh, something different. I'm going to show you uh, uh the the uh, first outcome which is uh, this one okay so this uh let me switch to shaded and let me turn off the mesh edges okay so this is actually stitching the the textile okay we can we can also create stitching on the, inside uh, kangaroo um Somebody once told me that uh, basically I was creating some kind of marvelous designer in uh, in Kangaroo. Well, it's not like that. Marvelous designer is one hell of a tool, actually. <laughs> but um, I'm going to quickly show you how you can create some stitching uh, inside uh, inside Kangaroo. Um, so I'm going to start from scratch and not exactly with this uh, example here. This is a, a particular example. You can you will have it here available in this script, but I'm, I'm going to create a, a new one. Okay, so uh, let's move over here, for example. Let's take uh, our classic uh, plane surface with, uh, well, actually, I will leave it like this, and then our mesh surface, and decide what's the density, what's the resolution of our uh, mesh. It's, it's a square. I don't want to, um, I don't want to, uh, let's say, um, work with a, a higher resolution and I want to give also an asymmetric uh, resolution. So I'm going to use the same slider both for U and B count. Um, so here it is, control M and we have the edges visible. Okay, so this is our uh, base mesh. And uh, what I want to do, I want to take another um, plane surface. Oh, well, actually I'm going to create this uh, um differently because uh it's uh, it's easier uh in this moment so i will define a rectangle here like set one rectangle and i will create a rectangle like here for example and then i want to create a boundary surface here from this rectangle here it is and now i want to convert also this surface here into a mesh uh, now, few consideration. Uh, of course, I can use the, the another mesh surface here. So I want to convert this one. Now, um, if we want to stitch this mesh to the other one, the only thing that matters is that both of them share the same amount of view divisions along the x-axis. Okay. So I don't care about the V count. I don't need this amount of polygons in the V direction. Okay. So V count, we can set it back to the original value, which is five. Or if you want, you can also reduce this uh, like one to five, for example, because actually we don't care uh, about how many polygons we have in the in the B direction. Okay. So the important thing is that we have the same amount of polygons in the U direction for both objects, because what we are going to do right now it's very simple. Uh, it's just creating a set of springs uh, that connect each vertex of the uh, lower edge of this huge surface here with the corresponding vertex of the upper edge of the small surface on the, at the bottom, okay? So for example, um, we can go into uh, Kangaroo 2 mesh uh, and take the naked vertices. Uh, this will give us all the vert vertices of the mesh, but divided into plotted points and naked points. I will take the um, naked points. So I only have the points uh, on the uh, border, along the border of this uh, uh, big mesh here. And I will do the same for the other one. 
Okay, so we have these two sets of points. Now, in order to stitch, we must connect all these points here with all these points here. So I only need the upper vertices of the, of the smaller surface and the lower vertices of the larger surface. So what I'm going to do, uh, considering, for example, the big square, I'm going to deconstruct these points here. So I have access to the Y coordinate and I only need the points that share the lowest Y coordinate, okay? We can, we can do, we can use several methods, of course, in order to, to get to the same result. But I decided to use these methods here because they give me the opportunity to show some standard grasshopper workflow. Okay. So I don't know, I don't know what's your uh, skill in the uh, skill level in grasshopper. So I prefer to use a, a standard method. Okay. So let's say that I want to use the Y component here and understand what's the smallest value. Uh, um, we discussed this already last week. Uh, you should work with domains in this case, but as I have Heteroptera, uh, Heteroptera plugin installed, so I will take the min max uh, component and I have the minimum, which is minus 10. Okay, uh, so I am going to uh, compare, I am going to compare the Y component with this minimum value. Uh, this is basically um, answering this, the question if the first number is equal to the second number. So if it is equal, it says true. If it is, um, uh, let's say, an, a, a different value, like we see we have uh, minus 9, minus 8, et, et cetera, then it will output a false. And then I, I will call pattern who the points using this pattern here. And you see that I already got the lower vertices. One, one consideration that uh, it might be important um, everything is simple now because we are working with a square uh, surface uh, on the XY plane and also because the original surface has a size between minus 10 and 10 and minus 10 and 10. So it's only working with integer numbers. But if you work, if you uh, use this method, for example, for isolating a particular set of vertices along the edge of, uh, of a surface and you don't have this kind of ideal situation, you might want to use similarity instead of equality, okay? Because equality looks for a perfect equality between two numbers. So if you have some difference, even at a very, very small decimal number, uh, then uh, this will output a false while you expected a true. So I recommend that eventually you use the similarity uh, component. And we are going to do the same here. So I'm going to copy paste this and use this, this but I want to use the maximum now. So here are the upper points. And so here are the two sets of points. They are the same amount of points because we use the same uh, slider for uh, dividing in the U direction. And so we can create these lines and have these uh, springs, additional springs that we are going to use. So everything is uh, actually uh, identical to the previous uh, simulation from now on. So uh, just let me quickly check that everything is fine with you. So um, uh, what did you find? Oh, OK. Um, uh, yes, Milena, I will be sharing this, de this definition, of course. Um, it will be available on my YouTube channel as soon as I upload this video. So remember, uh, this video will be available online uh, as a replay of this webinar. You will receive an email after the webinar uh, ends. But I remember, remember, check my YouTube channel uh, because this video will be available on my YouTube channel forever. And the, the link to download this definition will be available uh, over there. Where did you find boundary edge from? Well, actually, it's not boundary edge. Uh, if you go inside um, Kangaroo 2 and you go inside Mesh, you will find these naked vertices. OK, so naked vertices. Simply output all the vertices of your mesh, but divide it between clothed points and naked points. So I'm using naked points in order to work only with the points lying uh, along the border of our uh, mesh. Okay, so as you can see, this here. If you take, for example, clothed points, you have the inner points like this, but we don't care about them actually. Um, I, I hope this was the, the, uh, the, the question. Um, so uh, once we have these, uh, as I was saying, everything goes back to normal. So for example, let's say that we have the huge mesh and I want this mesh to be anchored to the corner points. 
So we go once again inside the mesh uh, group inside Kangaroo 2 and take the mesh corners. And here we are, we, he detects the, uh, the uh, four corners of our, of our uh, plane here. And I'm going to grab these and move it here at the bottom and use them as anchor points. Okay, so here they are. Um, then I'm, I want to apply gravity, for example, or a vertical load to this mesh. We already know that we go into gold's mesh and take the edge lengths. And I want to apply these edge lengths to this one here. And I want to apply edge lengths also to the other one, because also this one is going to be subject to gravity or to the same vertical load. So I can also plug this here, and we will have two sets of elastic uh, strengths. Remember that this is basically converting each edge into a spring. Okay, so that's why we have two sets over there. One belongs to the first surface, and the other one to the second surface, or mesh, uh, as you prefer. And uh, then we have these lines here. Um, well, sorry, uh, let's let's complete the mesh uh, uh, loads definition. So gold smash, vertex loads. I'm going to apply a vertex load to both our meshes. Like strength is going to be minus zero one, but it's perfect. It's just a, a standard value in order to create a balanced simulation with kangaroo, as we were saying uh, last week. Um, and then, OK, let's let's move on and let's consider these uh, these springs. Now, these are lines, so I'm going to goals line, take the line, length line component, and tell these lines uh, that they have a different elastic properties from the edges from the two, two surfaces, okay? Now, what, what are we going to do with this? Well, actually, I'm going to give them a different rest length. So their rest length, I want it to be zero, because I want them to contract infinitely in order to take a zero length during the simulation, which will bring this small uh, stripe here, this small uh, textile, to stitch uh, with the other one. So I'm going to calculate the length of these curves, and I'm going to multiply <coughs> this length by a multiplication factor, which is going to be simply zero. Uh, sorry, zero. Okay. Uh, I, I can also avoid this uh, because I could simply say length is zero, but normally this is not a panel, this is a slider. So I can determine determine how strong is the stitching, okay? But I'm going to use just zero. Just remember that you can uh, change this with a slider as we did last week, okay? So uh, this is basically our uh, uh, springs for the stitching. Um, here we can hide the meshes and we can prepare the kangaroo solver. Uh, so let's grab the uh, bouncy solver. Let's take a toggle. Oh, by the way, you see that I'm using the false start toggle. So remember, you might want to download the false start toggle, which will also be available as a link, download link uh, um, in the description of the video in the YouTube channel. Okay, so I'm going to use this and also a button for, for resetting the simulation. So here we have it. And now let's start plugging the uh, goals in our uh, solver. So one by one, we got these, and here are the springs stitching the object, okay? So if everything is just uh, ready, I think, so let's fire the simulation. Okay, yes, you see that we have this thing here stitching from, from the first body. Now, um, eventually, um, I'm going to, to do something uh, a little different right now. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to change the strength for this vertex load, which is, which is minus zero one. Uh, I'm going to set this to a slider between 0 0.00 and 0 0.5. So no vertical uh, load actually, but just, just to point out that the uh, small mesh is actually stitching to the, to the larger mesh along this line here, as you can see. So if I, for example, want to differentiate this uh, this behavior, okay? So I want to take uh, two uh, vertex loads and I want to connect uh, the first mesh, which is the bigger mesh to the first one and the smaller mesh to the second one, okay? So what I want to do right now, I want the first mesh to fall, uh, let me reset the simulation and plug the new goal reset it once again and set it to two, okay? So I want the first mesh, which is the bigger one, to fall upwards like this. 
like this. Okay? And I want the second mesh to fall downwards. So I'm going to create an expression like minus x. And I'm going to increase this value. So this is going to fall down. So eventually we have a more regular situation here where we can clearly understand that the second mesh, the smaller one, is hanging from the first one. So uh, this is how you create stitching, basically. And you, create, you can create stitching with basically whatever you want. Okay, so for example, uh, let's, um, and also in this case, you see that this object is basically falling upward quite uh, heavily, even if we are using just 0 0.01, that's because our meshes are very weak. So in terms of textile strength, they are very, very weak because they have a strength of one. Remember that when you work with real strengths, this value here easily increases up to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands uh units okay so for example if i say simply 101 you see that this thing is going to fall uh, let's say a little less okay so remember that this is an amplified uh, result that you get from from kangaroo which is proportional to the real uh, life scenario but it's uh, amplified okay and i will get rid of this because simulation becomes lower as as you know um so let's do something uh let's say a little more well, I, I wouldn't say complex, uh, actually. Um, let's, I, I will uh, turn this uh, off, which is an example for, uh, it, it's an example for this. Okay, so I'm going to do something like uh, uh, this. Let me grab, let me grab this um, jump here. So we know that we have a, a, we will have some examples. I will connect this jump to the uh, principal uh, scenario, and then you will be able to go from one to the other, like using this one. Um, so this is the first one. Uh, I want also to point out a different behavior, which is the behavior that introduced to this uh, kind of, of simulation that I, that I have made. Uh, but I'm going to um, do it a little more complex than this one. This is very simple. Okay, I'm going to do it just a little more complex so you have an idea of what's the meaning of working with, uh, let's say, particular stitching. Uh, so I'm going to work always with the same uh, rectangular plane. So simply let me uh, copy uh, this thing here. So I already have it uh, available. Uh, this is going to be my, my uh, original textile. Okay, uh, let me double check if everything is uh, clear. Um, uh, okay, uh, Giovanni, this is uh, this is a, a very good question uh, because uh, I'm not going to show it, but I'm going to tell you uh, what's the, the best technique that you might want to use. Um, uh, so Giovanni is, is asking in Italian uh, if uh, I want to give particular elastic properties, for example, or I want to create eventually a stitching, which is basically the same. Um, along this surface, but according to a, I don't know, let me create something like, according to this line, okay? So the problem, and, and I will just give you a quick, a quick explanation, okay? The problem in this case is that uh, you must give elastic, differentiated elastic properties or, or program is teaching along this curve, but this curve is not corresponding to the topology of your textile and not even with, with, to the topology of your additional textile eventually. So what I do recommend in this case is to do something like this. Um, if you have a inner edge that you want to consider, and this edge has a particular shape, I do recommend that instead of using, for example, a standard rectangular surface, like the one that we are using, uh, which is basically giving access to a uh, let me do this from 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 uh, Rhino, okay? So, uh, well, actually, here you cannot uh, change the resolution e easily. We should go into detailed control. It doesn't matter. So, the problem is that if you get if you work with a standard rectangular surface, you have a, a rectangular topology for your for your mesh, okay? And 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 uh, this means for your edges and vertices. But if you want this kind of uh, let's say let's say like a situation like this, so I want this. Uh, mesh to have a particular behavior like um, along this line, 
okay? So in this case, I will not use a rectangular surface or a rectangular mesh, uh, like for creating this, uh, this textile. Eventually, I will uh, use, I will do something like this. I would explode the rectangle. So you have access to these edges here. And eventually I would create a loft surface between this, this, and this, okay? Um, not loose, but uh, at least normal, at least normal. Uh, so, for example, if you do this, uh, you get one uh, object here, which is one single surface, okay? But the thing is that if you import this surface inside uh, Grasshopper, the topology of this surface is not the topology of this plane surface, which was basically an UV uh, topology. Well, actually, you always have a UV topology, but it's not linear in case of this loft, because the loft uses a, a third-degree interpolation in the direction of the loft. So in this case, if you mesh surface this one, what you get is a topology that corresponds to the uh, shape of your curve, okay? So in this case, for example, uh, let me show you with uh, uh, several more um, subdivisions, okay? So you see that here we have this kind of topology that actually interacts with your, um, with your curve. So in this case, this mesh is ready to work along this that particular direction, okay? Uh, also, you could do another thing uh, if you want things to be more precise. Um, uh, well, more precise, it means that if, if, in case you work with this, the, um, the subdivisions of your mesh, meaning the edges of your mesh, might not be coincident with the curve itself, as you can see. So you have an edge here and an edge here that is nothing correspondent to, to the actual curve. So if you want to um, better simulate this or be more precise, uh, what you must do, well, actually, let me do this in uh, in Rhino. Uh, what you must do will be to create a surface here using a loft uh, and another surface using the same curve and the other edge, okay? Uh, so here, if you work with just two curves in the loft, uh, that's why I was saying that, that nerve knowing nerve topology and geometry is absolutely important even, even when you work with grasshopper, okay? So that's why my book. But anyway, um, here the thing is that if you work with only just two edges for the loft, there is no possibility to get a, a higher degree interpolation between the two because it, it can only be a linear interpolation, as you can see from these isocurves here, which are straight. Uh, but it, it doesn't matter, okay? This is not a, a real problem because if I take these and say set multiple surfaces like this, now we have two meshes coming from this uh, conversion here, but they stitch exactly along the inner curve, okay? Uh, so eventually you might want to uh, join the two meshes together in order to have one single mesh, and then you can program the behavior along this uh, inner uh, organic edge, okay? So so this is the, I, I think this is what you wanted to uh, to know. But I give it, I, 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 I take it for granted. Um, so let's go back to our um, to our scenario here. So we have this, and what I want to do, I want to create some stitchings or some connection points, basically. Stitching are connection points. So if you see it like this, uh, you will quickly understand that the problem is creating connection point along this mesh. Uh, so for example, I have this mesh divided into 20 by 20 polygons, which means we have 21 vertices by 21 vertices, okay? So you have 441 uh, vertices like here. Um, so in this case, I'm not going to use, uh, well, actually, yes, I'm going to use the uh, naked vertices uh, because I don't want to create stitching uh, along the edges, okay? I just want the stitching to happen inside this, uh, uh, this mesh, okay? So I'm going back to Kangaroo, I'm going to mesh, and take once again naked vertices. But what I want to use this time are these points here. Now, when you want to create some stitching, like the one that I'm going to create right now, uh, you might want to understand how, how points are sorted inside this list, okay? So normally, I do recommend that you work with point list, because point list places a number uh, next to each point of this list. Uh, let me grab a 1.01. Uh, so here we have it. 
uh, let me also hide the points. So let's see. We have points uh, running from the bottom to the top. Okay, so they are sorted by columns, which was something that uh, that was expected. And you see that they, as it is one single list, you have from zero to 18, so 19 points. And then you go back from 19 to 37, other 19 points, and so on, up to 360. So uh, what we want to do right now is uh, basically create connections, so stitching, which means basically additional springs, okay? Uh, that will eventually contract to zero in order to pull two different points of the mesh uh, at the same position. And this will create the particular stitching that we are looking for. So for example, let's say that we want to create a stitching like, uh, let's say, connect the first point here with uh, the fourth point. And then we want to skip these two and then connect this one with the fourth on the right and then skip two and then connect this, skip to, and connect this, okay, and so on. Okay, so this is what we, we want to do. How can we program this? Well, first of all, if we want to connect this point with the fourth one, we must have these points, um, let's say, available in an intelligent structure. So that's why I was saying uh, at the beginning that we are going to deal a little with uh, uh, data manipulation. Uh, eventually, um, eventually some, some of you will get lost uh, that's why I, I encourage you to take a look at the data trees uh, webinar uh, from last week, available on my YouTube channel. So what I want to do is basically, um, well, they are already uh, sorted in columns. I want to separate each column from the other one. So basically, I want to create a data tree from this list of points. And each branch of the data tree must contain the amount of points which are present in each column. So basically, we have 19 points per column. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a partition list, and I want to uh, subdivide to partition the list into chunks. Each chunk will have a size of 19. But I will not create a panel with 19, even if I know that it will work. So if we take a look at, uh, at this um, tree that is coming out from here, we see there is no spare data, so we have 19 branches with 19 elements each. So we already know that, that things are working properly. But I will not use this because if I change the V count of my mesh using this slider here, I will not have 19 points. I will have more or less according to this value. So I'm going to uh, use this initial slider as the size of my partition list. So in this case, you see that things go wrong because we have this... Uh, spare value here in an additional branch because we must give size the expression x minus x minus minus one okay so in this case we will always will always have a, a an even um, distribution of uh, points inside the branches of this data tree okay so let's get rid of this param viewer and let's get rid of this well not I, I don't want to get rid of this point list because i want to show you what's the result of this so you see that point list when it works with separate sets it, it it uses a different color for each branch and you see that all the branches are ranging up to 18. okay so everything is working just fine why we did this because what i want to do i want to create connection between the points lying at the level of zeros for example just remember i want to connect this one with this one, okay? So they are both zero. And then, uh, for example, I want to skip one and I want to connect two with two. I want to skip three and connect four with four and so on, okay? So this is what I want to uh, to do. Uh, now, if we want to create a connection, for example, with point zero, point two, point four, and I want to, um, let's say, not consider the one, three, and so on, what I can do, I can take this partition list output which contains these columns here, and create, for example, a dispatch using the standard pattern, which is true-false. Because in this case, what I get, for example, from the list A are points 0. You see, I skip 1, 1, skip 1, 2, skip 1, 3, and so on. Okay, So I, am, I already got rid of these uh, uh, even lines here. Of course, if you want to work with the even lines, you just pick the list B. Okay. So it's just, just the same, but I want to work only with this uh, uh, with with these uh, old lines. 
And uh, in order to have a symmetrical situation here, for example, in order to have the first teaching occurring at this level here and the last one occurring at this level here with the same separation from the edge, okay, this means this slider here must be only even numbers. Okay, because if I give this slider the possibility to take odd numbers, then when it is odd, you see that you have a different uh, distance between this line of points and the edge and this line of point and the corresponding edge. So I would say you must only provide even numbers. Okay, so 20 and 22, 24, and so on. You see that the distance is the same. Um, so here we have our points. These are the points that we want to work with. Um, also, um, one other thing that we can uh, that we want that we want to do right now is uh, get rid of the uh, intermediate points. So, if we have a connection uh, running between this one and this one, we must uh, eliminate these three points here. Okay. Now, how many points? How many connections do we want to create? So, remember that we, in this case, we have nineteen points in the horizontal direction. Okay. And we want to use just, for example, well, 19, we can uh, skip, uh, let's say, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5. No, we need to skip one more in order to have things uh, evenly distributed, like 1, let's skip 4. So we have this, let's skip 4, we have this, 4, this. Now, I think we better work with uh, also with even numbers in the u direction to keep things uh, simple okay so in this case we have 19 uh, points it's better if we go back to an even amount of uh, number which means that um, if the v count must be even the u count must be odd okay so if i say odd numbers now in this case we will have an even number of points along this direction um, this corresponds to the amount of uh, branches of our data tree you see that this branch ranges from 000 to 0019 uh, so it means that it has 20 branches so 20 columns basically and in this case it's easier to create a, an even uh, subdivision uh, of uh, of points so for example let's say that i want to pick uh, one column out of x columns okay how do i do this because now i have to work with uh, um, data branches data tree branches so we have these i'm going to simplify this tree in order to have a simple uh, index uh, for the uh, branch name so you see that uh, if we don't simplify it we have uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0001 and so on but if we simplify we only have the 0 1 2 3 4 5 up to 19 okay so what i need to do is pick branch zero, and then, if, for example, pick branch three, and then pick branch seven, and so on. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to create. Uh, let's say that we start from from something um, uh, easier. Okay. So I'm going to uh, take a series. I'm going to take a series, and uh, first branch is called zero okay so the start value is going to be zero now what branches do i want to work with uh, in, in in this moment well i want to work with the first one and let's say the third one the fourth one so you see that i am considering zero two four six eight and so on okay so the step in my series will be two okay and then i already get this list of values which i'm going to use as uh, the branch name that I want to retrieve from this data tree. And uh, if you must consider how many branches we have in this data tree. Okay. So for example, um, the, the count or meaning the amount of uh, values we want to output from this series uh, must provide a, a, a set of values, which is basically, um, which can be used for retrieving branches from this data tree. Because if we provide, for example, a, a value here of 25, while our data tree only reaches 19, then we will get some error, okay? But let's see it, and in, in case we can also, um, let's say, not consider this particular situation because things should, also, sh should work properly, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a three branch. Three branch, this is the tree that I want to uh, retrieve a branch from. 
and it asks for the path. Now, the path is not just the number, okay? So it asks for a real path. So you see the, the hexagonal icon, it's basically a small tree, uh, white tree inside the, the black hexagon. So it's asking for a path, and we must uh, build, construct a path starting from these indices here. Now, the problem is that if we provide a list of indices here, the path that this thing is creating is like this. So it's taking each of the value from uh, as a, a index of the same path. We want to create a list of paths. So I'm going to graph the indices and we get this um, distribution here. Of course, as I graphed it, I get a tree of branches, but I need a list of paths. So I'm going to flatten the output and here finally we get a list of uh, uh, paths for our tree branch. Okay, so you can see that now we get uh, one column out of two. Okay, but the, the the columns that we get depends on the step. Okay, so if I take the step, for example, and set it to a slider between one and I don't know ten. Okay, so let's see what happens. So if I do this and I do this. Okay, if this is two, well, if, if this is one, of course, we get just uh, the half the amount of columns, okay? Because we are working with uh, uh, with uh, a, a, a series where we provide zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, but our tree only, well, actually our tree uh, has 19 branches, so 20 branches. We are providing 10 indices. So we are only getting half the amount of columns, okay? But if I set this to two, we get this. If I set it to three, we get this, four, five, six, seven, eight. You see that we can decide what's the step between our uh, columns, okay? Uh, so for example, let's say we want to work with, uh, um, uh, actually, well, two. Let's work with two for now, and then eventually you could uh, try and do something different uh, for, for your own. So uh, I'm going to uh, move this up. I hate um, spaghetti in uh, in grasshopper, so I try to keep uh, cables, uh, let's say, without creating too much intersections. So we have this here, uh, and now we must understand how these uh, uh, values are sorted. Okay, so I take this, and we have zero, 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 the first column, and then one, 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 etc., etc. But keep in mind that we are skipping this horizontal line actually and this vertical line as well, okay? Uh, so basically what I want to do right now is connect uh, these points together, these points together, these points together, okay? So this is the stitching that I want to create. Now, how can we do this? Uh, let's take a look with a panel to this data tree so we can see the data inside. So we have, this is the first point zero, which is this one. This is the second point zero, which is this one. So I want to connect them together, but they belong to different um, to different uh, lists, to different branches, okay? So how do I do this? Well, the first thing that I can do is basically sort these points, not by column, because I don't want to stitch them vertically, I want to stitch them horizontally. So I want to sort them not by column, uh, but by rows, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to flip matrix, this tree, and so, I get a different tree. Actually, this is a symmetrical tree because it has the same amount of branches and data, okay? But I am flipping these values. So you see that if I consider the original tree, you see that minus nine, minus nine is the first point, and minus seven, minus nine is the first point of the second uh, column. If I take this, you see that minus nine, minus nine, and minus seven, minus nine are in the same group, okay? So I am, I am seeing the same points but they are sorted, they are ordered for by rows and not by columns, okay? So in this case, for example, if I take a polyline and connect these points together, I am connecting all the points horizontally. And then what I want to do, I want to explode this polyline, okay? So I have access to the segments and I want to dispatch these segments. So if I take, for example, list A, I only have one line out of two. Okay, so finally, this is what we were we, we were uh, 
um, uh, looking for. So we already know uh, what are the lines for our uh, for our stitching, inner stitching inside this mesh. Okay. So you see, it's quite uh, let's say um, uh, well, I wouldn't say complex. Okay. So it's, uh, it's uh, a a bunch of components that you might want to use in order to achieve this result. But it's uh, very interesting to take a look at what result we are going to get right now. So this is the mesh. And the mesh, we can treat it as we already know. So elastic property. Uh, eventually, I will give this a vertex loads with a very small strength. So I want this to fall, uh, well, let's leave it like this, minus 0 0.1. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's basically irrelevant for us. We want to take a look at the effect of the stitching, OK? Uh, so I want to apply a load and I want to uh, create anchor points. Now, in this case, for example, I'm going to create anchor points starting from the naked points. So remember, I'm going to use these naked points here as anchor points. So our textile will be anchored all along the border. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, okay, so we have elastic properties for the mesh and load and anchor points. Now we only miss the stitching and we already know that the stitching uh, uh, is uh, length line so i'm going to do well actually i can jump directly to length line i will set this to zero but remember that um it, it's better to work with a rest length with a length factor which gives us more control over the final result uh so yeah basically that's pretty it i'm going to take the toggle and the button as well and that's it. And I'm going to plug the goals. Here they are. And also in this case, I want to, well, actually, uh, the problem is that uh, when you see this with uh, uh, springs, which are basically the segments, um, it's, it's quite difficult to understand what happens. But yeah, you see that we have already some stitching going on. So you see there is this kind of uh, local deformation with correspondence to our, to our uh, uh, stitches. Uh, so I'm going to grab a, a mesh. I'm going to clean the. Um, I'm going to clean the data. Oh, sorry, it's not threshold. It's reset. Reset. Yeah, like this. So I'm going to clean the data. Run coming out from the from Kangaroo. I'm going to tell Kangaroo I want to show the uh, original mesh. So it's going to be. Oh, it's quite far. So it's like this and like this so we have the mesh already visible and i'm going to clean the the tree because i want to get rid of the null objects so i can apply for example a, a subdivision algorithm like the cutmore clark with an amount of subdivision that ranges from one to three no more and i want to also keep the corner fixed because i don't want the cutmore clark to smoothen the vertices the corners okay so corner fix and i get this uh, uh, nice uh, behavior here so i'm going to run the simulation right now and you see that the stitching looks like this of course you can see it like with more uh, resolution if you increase the amount of subdivision of your cutmore clark but yeah this is the effect of our stitching which is quite nice Right, looks like having some, uh, let's say, um, lines of uh, stitching in the V direction, but we know that this is not true. Actually, we have horizontal stitching uh, in the U direction of the mesh. Okay, uh, and this is pretty funny because we you can uh, create basically the stitching, which is uh, 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 only deciding what type of connection you want inside your your uh, mesh. Okay. So this is this is what you must do in order to create some very very nice and particular uh, behaviors. Um, I don't know if I already showed you, but uh, if I go here in my hard drive, sorry for the chaos, but uh, go to marketing and and uh, design, and I have here textiles. And here in textiles, you will see that there are a bunch of things happening. But what I want to show you is this image. So this is a some nice and funny stitching that I programmed inside this uh, uh, square uh, piece of textile. Okay, so it's just programming where you want to uh, place the zero length springs along this the mesh, and you get this kind of uh, of behavior. Okay.
Um, I don't know if there are any questions here. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Fernando. Is this going to be reposted anywhere? Yes, it's going to be um, uploaded into my YouTube channel. Um, uh, could we imagine to build the Sagrada Familia conceptual model? Of course you can. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah, of course you can. Um, actually, actually, um, it's uh, easier than uh, than the thing that we are doing because the Sagrada Familia is just catenary curves. Okay, so you can create exactly the same models that that uh, Gaudi was uh, uh, was uh, was creating, um, and and moreover, Gaudi had to work with uh, with. Uh, um, uh, let's say a real world gravity force so he, he had to place a mirror uh, on the floor in order to to see what the real structure would look like uh, to invert the, the the image okay but we can program kangaroo to work with positive gravity okay the only thing uh, a possible that is um Alice, yes it is possible to give thickness to the to the textile i'm going to show it in a while uh, can you quickly repeat the thing about even an odd number, please, U and V? Yes. Okay. So, um, yes, basically, uh, the, the U and the B parameter here uh, needs to need to be uh, set properly if we want to simplify the work in terms of selecting the columns of points. Okay. Um, so, basically, I was saying I need the V count to be um, even numbers because I want the stitching to have the same separation from the upper edge and lower edge, okay? So um, let me turn off the simulation and reset and just see the original mesh. Okay, um, and grab the naked vertices, okay? So um, if, uh, as we are selecting with our uh, dispatch, we are selecting uh, basically a, a bunch of uh, of points, right? So I want these columns here. I want them to start at, from this point here and reach to this point here. I don't want them to reach this one, okay? Because if I reach this one, I don't have the same separation from the bottom and upper edge. Of course, you see that now we don't have the same separation from the right and left edge, but this depends on the U count, okay? So in this case, for example, as we are dealing with a, a, um, a um, well, it actually it's the same process. But anyway, uh, if we set this, for example, to, uh, let's say, an uh, odd number like 21, you see that this row of points is not correspondent to the same distance uh, from the upper edge as the lower point line from the bottom edge, okay? So that's why I set these to even numbers. Okay, so we have this constant separation between the two edges. We should do the same with the other one, okay? Because if we do this, you see that we, we have some kind of, a, of a strange separation, but this is because we are not taking into account the amount of points uh, horizontally here. We are just taking into account the vertical uh, uh, distribution. You might want to adjust the uh, U count in order for this definition to work properly. You see that the V count actually is connected also to the, uh, where was it, to the size of the partition list. So we have a relationship between the amount of points vertically and the amount of points that uh, are, um, let's say, contained inside any of these chunks. But we don't have, we are not using the U count in the rest of the definition. That's why you don't see this uh, parametric behavior. Um, and as regards the, the thickness of the textile, yes, you can do this. Um, of course, you have to work with, uh, with the weaver bird. In this case, it's the easiest way. And um, uh, one thing, <clears throat> you can give thickness to a textile like, well, I have the uh, high resolution mesh like this, and I run the simulation like this, I stop the simulation, and uh, I can give thickness to this one with the uh, mesh thicken component from Weaverbird. Be before uh, using this one, I do recommend that you uh, adjust the distance value because it is set to five by default. And you see that in, this, in our case, five would be, let's say, this thick, which is too much if you if compared to the extension of our textile. So I will take this as a slider between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1, eventually set it to the maximum and plug it here and plug the mesh, okay? So now we have a mesh with some thickness, as you can see, 
right? Uh, but I do not recommend to do this uh, this way because this gives a funny uh, vertical wall here in uh, along the border of our mesh. I do prefer normally to do like this. Give thickness to the, uh, let's say, um, low resolution mesh, okay? Because here you have this vertical wall, basically, but then apply the Catmull Clark to this uh, solid mesh here, okay? So the difference is that you get this nice uh, edge uh, uh, smoothing around the, the textile, okay? That's the difference, but I think it's important. Um, in order to have a more, um, let's say, a realistic representation of the textile. Else, you will get this uh, hard surface uh, on the surrounding of your of your mesh, okay? So this is the easiest way to give thickness to this mesh. I can bake this and, uh, and uh, turn off um, kangaroo and grasshopper and see it, for example, in Arctic, which is quite fast. So you see that this is a solid mesh. And being a solid, you can also eventually, uh, I don't know, 3D print it eventually, if you want. But anyway, um, we are not going to discuss digital fabrication today. Stitch line horizontal, but we should be appeal vertical. Yeah, because, well, it actually, I'm going to draw it like with a scheme here. So saying that we have this mesh, Okay, and saying that uh, it, it is basically a, a regular grid and uh, it is already an elastic uh, mesh, okay? And then I want to create a stitching between this point here and this point here. So this stitching here, what it does is take this point and move it like to here and take this point and move it like to here. So if I create this stitching also along this line, along this line, you, you will have this point and this point converging here this point and this point converging here and etc etc so your mesh is actually condensing along this line which means that according to the fact that we also have gravity acting on our mesh the mesh will do something like this okay it is going to do something like this because this point and this point will be coincident here and here okay so horizontal lines means basically vertical uh, stitching okay um uh so i do not get the mesh out of my clean tree component what could be the error oh um hmm. what could be the the error um do you have your show component here this is the first thing that comes to my mind because if it doesn't come out from this clean tree maybe it's not receiving the mesh okay uh so this appears red because it is not receiving any mesh, because eventually you didn't place the show component here. I don't know. Um, uh, uh, well, okay, Giovanni is asking if uh, if adding, uh, let's say, collisions would uh, make this simulation uh, work um, more properly. Yes, of course. Co co well, self-collision is something that you might want to use always when you uh, program textile simulation. Uh, the problem with self-collision in this case, for example, is that I, I don't know if it gives you some uh, uh, value added because um, let's say that your mesh is actually trying to do something like this. I'm working with the low, I'm representing the low resolution. Okay, so like this. At the low resolution level, this point can be coincident with this one because our spring tends to be zero length, okay? So let's say that we have a perfect, um, let's say, uh, collapsing no, of, of this mesh. So you say, if I give some collision like sphere collide, there would be a physical distance between these two, which is determined by the spherical light. I, I think this is this is what I understand from your question. So yes, of course, you might want to do this, but remember that the kind of um, textile simulation that we uh, are doing right now is uh, some approximation of the real uh, effect. So it's very difficult that with Kangaroo, you get a, a realistic aspect also at a very detailed level, okay? Uh, so, but yes, um, hypothetically speaking, yes, you could do uh, uh, like add uh, sphere collision to control how close the different part of your mesh um, get together 
uh, along the stitching lines. Yes, of course. Uh, between irregular random points. Oh, yeah, of course, if you want, but um, I, I would not do it. I mean, um, so um, MM, I, I don't know what's your name, but MM is asking um, uh, if we can also program some stitching between random points. Uh, of course we can, uh, but the behavior would be totally uh, random. And I don't know what, what would be the use for it. Um, normally, you want to create pattern on on the surface of a textile. Okay, so uh, honestly, I, I don't know what you would do with it, but anyway, yes, you can do it. it it's uh, well, I, I'm going to show you um, one uh, easiest way of creating this kind of uh, of thing. It's like going back to the selection of points. So I'm going back to these uh, clotted points. Okay, so this is a regular pattern right here, and I'm going to turn it off. And uh, let's go back to our uh, clothed points like this. So what I want to do, the easiest way that I can imagine is, uh, uh, well, eventually uh, use heteropter as well, uh, because I want to use some kind of incestus network. But remember that you can do it uh, also with um, some standard grasshopper components like your random reduce. And uh, let's say you want, you have a list of uh, 380 and you want to eliminate something like 150 uh, points. So you have these, eventually you can also increase and have less of them. And if you don't like it, you can also change the seed. So you change the distribution of these points. Uh, once you have these, the problem with this random set is to create single segments, okay, between these points. But anyway, I'm going to create some kind of uh, of a random connection. In this case, uh, you might want to use the mesh triangulation Delaunay H if you want. Uh, this gives you uh, this set of, uh, of line, and this line can be programmed like um, like springs that tends to be zero. But you know, it's, it's it's something very it's very unlikely that you get some kind of a nice result. Eventually, you might want to work with incestus network from from Heteroptera. I, I think I'm going, yeah, I'm going to uh, take the suggestion for from Leonardo and I'm going to uh, organize a webinar uh, next week about Heteropter because it's very, very uh, nice to work with it. But anyway, so we have this set of points and so we can program the connection by distance and number. I would say that distance can be something between, let's say 2.00 according to the dimension of my, of my textile. And the number of, of uh, connection, I'm going to set it to two just to have a slider between uh, at least one and 10. And then I'm going to grab these points here. Okay, so you see that in this case, you can create some nice uh, connection schemes and you can also create some, let's say, weird connection schemes if you want, okay? Now, in this case, I am working with uh, the whole set of points, but if we work with the random reduce, uh, we can decide, for example, how many connection we want to uh, create uh, between these points. Oh, I deleted too many. And you see that we get some, some nice connection schemes that eventually are more interesting than the random triangulation that you get from the Delaunay edges. okay? Um, so eventually, these would have to have a more elegant or more relevant connection scheme. And in this case, you will program, let's say, your, max, your mesh is going to collapse along, along this area, more or less, and this area here, and this one, and this one, and so on. So this is some kind of nicer uh, design if you if I might say so. Uh, so yeah, the, the point is basically converting some lines into springs and you can also select the points randomly if you want. But I repeat, I, I wouldn't do this, okay? It's, it's something that uh, basically it has no, no uh, real meaning uh, in, in textile design. Um, so yes, basically this is, uh, this is it. Um, I'm going to leave it here like with another, uh, another jump like from uh, here to here. So we have two jumps, two definitions here. And in order to, to see it, well, actually it's, this is a very simple scenario, okay? And uh, this is creating this single stitching. Um, so you see that this is very nice, actually. It's, it's a, a very nice image. Uh, I, think, I think I'm going to use it someday, but um, uh, you see that here things are very, very simple. Okay, so for example, uh, I have this stitching occurring inside this mesh and let's see how I program this one. You see that it's always the plane, the mesh and the vertices, okay? 
Um, so I grabbed, these are the vertices of my mesh. Let's, let's uh, get rid of the high resolution mesh. These are the vertices of my mesh. And then I grabbed a point container like this one. Okay, and I defined two points here. And then I take the closest points of the mesh grid and connect them together with a polyline, which gives us one single segment, okay? And I convert this segment into a line with rest length zero in order to stitch this point here with this point here. Of course, the stitching is variable. I can move this point, for example, around like this, and you will see that the line that comes out basically reacts to this displacement. So I can stitch, for example, this point with this point, okay? So I change things. And in the end, when I run the simulation, I will leave this line visible and also the connection points. So when I run the simulation right now, you will see that the stitching occurs at this level. Okay. Now you see that we have this, uh, the stitching doesn't reach the, the um, uh, midpoint between these two because we are working with the cutmore clark subdivision, which is a, a smoothing of the original mesh. But if we take the original mesh, you see that it tends to reach this midpoint here. Okay. Uh, if we want to reach exactly the midpoint, you might want to increase the strength of the uh, stitching. Okay. The stitching now has a strength of 10. If I, yeah, 10. So it's not enough to have these points exactly coincident. Uh, if you want, you can increase the strength and have the, the, proper, the proper result. But anyway, it's just um in order to to have things uh, uh running smoothly okay so this is the new stitching and of course uh keep in mind that if i try to move these points like this you see that kangaroo doesn't react uh, remember that in kangaroo each um uh, change you make on the geometric system uh do it with the simulation not running okay so stop the simulation make changes to your to your geometric system and then run the simulation again okay because else kangaroo either crashes or uh, gives you a weird result for your for your simulation okay so this was the 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 case that i um, prepared uh, for this uh, definition and um let me see if uh, everything is uh, clear uh yes i suppose you are talking about the heteroptera um oh <laughs> here we have a special guest um which is my daughter uh that she was curious about uh she was curious about <laughs> knowing what i was doing today but anyway uh can you use kangaroo to simulate a fixed rod weaving through a split in a fabric the object is to calculate the perimeter of the 3d fabric flat and 2d okay so this is uh this is something that uh you you don't want to do i mean um you know this uh, well actually actually uh, you can get to uh, a let's say quite a good approximation but there are plugins that allow to to uh, calculate the um, deformations for example like um um exact flat for example i think it's the best plugin actually um to to do this kind of calculation um but uh, you can you can do it you can try it uh dana with this uh, uh with this with kangaroo but remember that it's it's like uh, i wouldn't say it's ready for production okay i, I wouldn't say it uh, mostly because as i was uh, saying last week mostly because um it's very difficult to work with uh, real life materials in kangaroo you might want to use the uh, script that i have uh, that i share on my website in order to work with uh, real elastic strengths um i'm going to eventually well let me see if i have it here um where is it where is it i don't see it um no i don't see it right now but anyway it's it's on my website okay so there is a script that i am sharing on my website which is called basically um real elastic strength in with, with kangaroo and uh, there you can program your textile to behave exactly like a specific textile like i don't know cotton or whatever this would help uh, to uh, simulate exactly the behavior of the textile and this uh, can also help you in the moment you want to translate this simulation inside uh production okay 
Um, so yes, Leonardo, the Heteroptera webinar is going to happen. Um, and let's give a quick look at this last example, uh, which is something that uh, it's, it's the answer to a question from last week. I decided to, to uh, put it in, in Kangaroo because I think it's, uh, it's something um, interesting. It has to deal with teaching as well. So I am, I am uh, uh, providing a solution that uses actually teaching. So the question last week was, can I uh, simulate a two layers fabric? Like for example, having two fabrics connected together. And now with what we just saw, it's evident that it is possible. It's like programming these connections here, like a stitching with, but it's not a stitching with a zero rest length. It's a stitching with some specific um, rest length. Okay. So that's what I do here in this, uh, in this script. So let's, let's go through it uh, because this is quite uh, long and um, I don't want to waste time uh, like repeating this, but you see, First thing is basically the same one, the same thing. Uh, I'm going to show it step by step, so you will have an idea of uh, what happens here. So in this case, for example, I provided a, a construction, a construct point with two different point and at different height, zero and one. So I create two plane surface using these two um, uh, origin plane. Uh, you know that uh, this is asking for a plane, but if you give a point which has no orientation, Grasshopper uses automatically the horizontal orientation uh, passing through these two points, okay? So we have two plane surfaces and then we have two meshes here with some separation that's defined by this step here, okay? Um, and then I take these two meshes and the important thing is the, in this definition, I, I strongly encourage you to, to analyze and study this because there is a, an interesting use of uh, data manipulation, okay? And also with refer with refer to to uh, kangaroo output. So I'm going to discuss this uh, in a while. Okay. But anyway, you see here we have deconstruct mesh, which gives you access to the vertices. We have two sets of vertices, of course, because we have two meshes. Okay. So what I want to do is to create connection between uh, the two meshes, which would be the um, fixed length uh, stitching. Okay. So I take this uh, tree where the vertices are, are grouped by mesh. And then I flip it so we have vertices grouped by a uh, connection scheme, basically. Okay, so we have a couple of points corresponding to the same position along the mesh. And then I create a polyline connecting this uh, pair of points. Okay, so these are the lines that I want to use for the stitching. Actually, they simply go through the length and the uh, multiplication and length line. So actually, if I set this B to zero, then the two layers of textile would collapse onto each other, okay? But then I decided to program this um, uh, rest length factor using a graph mapper. Uh, so actually I can program the separation between these two layers of textile using some kind of equation of, of graphic here, okay? So if example, for example, now I have a, a line I have a uh, linear graphic and I have to take the two handles here and place them here at the top. Why? Because in this case, the graph mapper outputs a set of ones. Okay. And then I remap them in a zero to one domain. So we only get one, 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 one. Okay. So basically what I'm doing, I'm saying that the rest length of this line is the actual length. Okay. Because I'm multiplying this length by one. Well, I can get rid of this slider here because it is no longer in use. So this is what happens here. I'm defining basically the um, the rest length factor as we did before uh, in our in our previous definitions. Okay. Um, one thing, of course, when you work with the uh, graph mapper, the graph mapper must provide the same amount of values as the amount of lines that we have here. So I simply used a list length to understand how many lines, how many connections do we have here? Actually, it, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, quite redundant because we already know how many connections we have because we know the amount of vertices depends on the amount of polygons we defined for the two meshes, okay? So it is simply this plus one multiplied by this plus one, okay? So in this case, we get uh, 441, okay? Uh, I need 441 values. Remember that a range uh, gives you one number more than the amount of steps. 
So if I say 441 to this, we will get 442. So I subtract one, so we get 441, okay? So that's the, the calculation, the, the little data handling that you must do before using the, the graph map, okay? Um, and then the rest is basically the same. We get the mesh to be converted into an elastic net. Uh, the corner, the four corner are being used as the anchor points, actually the eight corners because they are, they are two meshes. I am applying a vertical load uh, with 0 0.1 intensity to both meshes using the um, two sets of vertices that come out from this uh, deconstruct mesh. And then, yes, here I have a sphere, well, the show, of course, and then here we have the sphere collide, because I, as I told you, working with textile, sphere collide is mandatory, because you don't want the textile to self-intersect. Uh, so, yeah, basically, sphere collide here. Um, I flatten the amount, the, the points, the vertices, because if we don't flatten the vertices, this sphere collide will basically work uh, at um, each of the two levels. Okay, so it will calculate collision for the first mesh and then calculate, calculate the collision for the second mesh. There will be no uh, collision between the two objects. Okay, so that's why you must flatten the points here. And uh, yeah, basically that's it. There is the simulation <coughs> running here. Um, and then this, this is important. Okay, um, so the only thing that I, that I uh, want to discuss about this simulation is uh, the, the, the way I am using the data after the simulation, okay? So um, as we plugged here, elastic lines, elastic net, and uh, we also have the show component, okay? So the output from the simulation, if you take a look at it, it contains a couple of meshes, which are the two layers of textile. And then there is some null now and then. Then there are lines. Okay, you see line, 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 a whole bunch of lines, many lines, actually. Okay, then null, 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 and then line once again. And then null. Okay, so now I want to get rid of this null, of course. So the easiest way, the, the, the usual way is to use the container for the type of data that you want to isolate and then clean the tree so you only get that type of data. Okay, so I get 2,121 lines. Okay. And what I wanted to do with this simulation was to basically, um, let me uh, hide this. What I wanted to do, I, I, I get this result, okay? I already get a result. And if I run the simulation, I already have this kind of, of behavior happening. Now, what I wanted to do right now was to understand which parts of the connection of the stitching between the two layers of textile um, were more stressed, okay? So I assume, uh, which is an approximation, of course, it depends on many factors, but I assume that the more the, the lines that, they, that get more stressed are the lines that become larger after the simulation, okay? So I need to isolate the connection lines in order to paint them with uh, some kind of color, which is something that is happening with this thing here. So this is actually painting the lines with a color according to the stress they are receiving. So I repeat, I uh, approximate the stress with the variation in length uh, of these lines, okay? So you see that it is converged and we have these lines that are getting more or less stressed. And this uh, is basically represented by this gradient here. Now, how do I isolate these lines in this set of 2,121 lines. So the more important thing that you must know about data manipulation is that Grasshopper doesn't change the way that data are, are sorted inside a list or a tree, whatever, unless you tell him to do so, okay? So there is no reason for Grasshopper to change in which order these lines appear in this list with respect to what? To how you connected the springs coming from the lines and the and the mesh inside the goal objects okay so i plugged first i plugged the um 
the um, edges, well, sorry, the uh, linear springs, and then I plugged the edge lengths component into goal objects, okay? So here, I, I did it uh, in an explicit way in order to, to make it uh, clearer, okay? So here, what I'm going to do, I am partitioning this list in order to create three branches, okay? The first branch will contain the edges, the connection edges, so the stitching, four, four, one, okay? And then the second and third branch will connect, will, will uh, contain the edges from the two meshes, 840, 840. Now, uh, of course, uh, this is something I wouldn't do with a panel like this, okay? This is something eventually I would do exactly connecting the uh, parameters coming from the, from the geometric system here directly to the size, okay? But I wanted to be explicit. So if I plugged the uh, edge length, the, sorry, the length line first, I know that I am working with 441 because we already calculated this like here. So we have 441 and I would eventually plug it exactly this wire here to the size of my partition list. Well, I did it here with a panel, okay? But it's the same. And then we have twice the amount of edges of our two meshes. So if you want to analyze this, you can take a, a mesh, mesh edges. Here it is, mesh edges. You have here two sets, of course. You see that uh, each mesh uh, has uh, 80 naked edges plus 760 interior edges. So 760 plus 80 is 840, okay? So with this, you know how what's the value you have to plug here. You have to plug it twice because you have two meshes and not just one. But this is actually creating a, 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 a data tree where you have the first branch contains 441 uh, lines and the second and the third contain 840. Of course, I want to work with the first branch, so I simply explode the tree and take the first branch. Uh, so you see that despite the color, which is just painting it with a gradient, this is the first branch. And then you have the second branch, which are the edges from the lower mesh. And then third branch are the edges from the upper mesh. Okay. So this is a nice example of, of data manipulation in this, um, um, let's say, cleaning or, or separation of the output from, from Kangaroo, okay? And then it's just, let's say, applying a gradient. So I calculated the length of the, of the same edges, of the same stitching lines before the simulation and after the simulation. And then you run a division here and then you take this number, calculate the minimum and maximum. This is always an heteroptera component. Use them as, well, actually, you see that there is some inverted cable here because if I use the minimum as lower limit and the maximum as upper limit, I will get that the stressed line are blue and the, let's say, relaxed line are red. I want it to be uh, the opposite. So I want the stress to be red, okay? And then we have this kind of, uh, of representation. Um, and then there is some kind of visualization. So I also cleaned up the, uh, the, the uh, output for the mesh uh, result. And then we have these uh, two meshes here represented in, in white. This, you might want to see it in white frame in order to avoid too many uh, chaotic uh, overlapping of geometries. And then there is also a, uh, let's say, smoothing occurring here, but it's not that relevant. Okay, so I will keep it uh, off. Uh, so it will it will not affect the calculation. So let's see what's the, the reason why I, I've used this uh, uh, graph mapper here is that now I can change the uh, rest length of these lines here according to this graph. So if I decrease this, I am saying that I want the edges on this side here to become shorter than the edges on that on the other side. Okay. So remember that I am assuming, it's an approximation, that more length corresponds to more stress. Actually, it should not be like this, okay? It depends on the elastic force that, that's acting in this, uh, in this system, okay? But it's more interesting if I, for example, switch to a different graph types. For example, the one that I was using in the, um, in the example that I uploaded is uh, a Gaussian, okay? So Gaussian actually has a first uh, portion of zeros, last portion is zero, and then it increases and falls once again, just like reading this Gaussian bell, okay? So if I increase the height of this, you see that basically there is actually very small um, uh, changing occurring here because I am remapping the values, 
okay? So if I remap all these values here and I use this zero to one, well, I will get always a uh, maximum uh, rest length of uh, the same actual length because I am multiplying it by one. But if I increase this, I say that these springs can become twice the original length, okay? Uh, there is also the elastic net that it's actually containing this uh, uh, this uh, um, deformation, okay? But if I also say that the uh, zero here corresponds to some stretching or to some length, then I can have this kind of, uh, of behavior, okay? And then you see that I have this kind of variation between in the distance between the two uh, layers of textile, okay? Uh, so it's just it's just for fun. I mean, it, it doesn't have a real uh, meaning unless you want to um, simulate some kind of filling between the two layers of uh, of textile with some differentiated behavior or, or physical property. Okay, so th this is uh, the only thing that comes to my mind right now. But uh, I repeat, it's something that it's uh, it, it starts to become quite complex in terms of uh, um, describing the physical system. Okay. So yeah, basically uh, that's all that I wanted to to discuss with you today. Let me double check if you have some some question. Um, uh, see, yes, um, okay. No problem, uh, Alicia. So uh, well, actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, draw on. Uh, YouTube and look for a guy which is called like uh, this and uh, oh here by the way you see that there is already the first session for the textile simulation webinar and also the data trees which is this one okay so I encourage you to take a look especially at this one if you already saw the um, textile simulation uh, session but I wanted to show you um, the um kangaroo probably okay yeah um some origami going on okay like cushion simulation no there, there was another one oh yeah this one okay so blanket simulation okay so alicia i think you you want something like uh this this is a blanket falling on the body of a model okay so you see well, quite a curvy model, but anyway. So uh, you see that that this is exactly uh, what, what you're talking about, actually. Okay. So yes, you can do it, and and I, I was saying just that you can uh, you can program collisions, not only self collisions, but also uh, collisions between with other objects. Okay. So you see that in in uh, Kangaroo Two, you have this whole set of uh, of uh, uh, colliders, basically, of, of collision function. Okay, so this is the first thing that you might want to uh, look at. But there are also uh, other components that, that might help when programming some collisions. Okay. Um, thank you, Alicia. Uh, thank you. Could you repeat why you're using the graph mapper instead of the number slider? I got lost. Well, actually, um, thanks for answering that question. <laughs> okay, Angelica. <laughs> nice to have you here, Angelica. Angelica is uh, one of our, uh, let's say, friends. Um, yeah, uh, the, actually, uh, yeah, I, ca I can, I can repeat it. Uh, there is no actual reason. Uh, it's just for fun, just to create some uh, uh, variable uh, separation between the two layers of textile. Uh, so, uh, so well, I repeat, there is no particular meaning. Um, you can use a, a, a slider and, and there is no problem. This is just changing the separation between the two layers. So if I say I want to use a sign function, for example, uh, and I want to run the simulation, uh, you see that I am changing the separation between, in, in this case, it's like uh, uh, three quarter of the original length of the springs uh, up to, I think we are on the top. So it's twice the original length, but it's just for fun. If you, uh, for example, change this, you will have this wavy separation between the two layers of uh, of, of your textile. Okay, it's, it's not a, a real uh, a real life scenario. Okay, it's just to play around with uh, this um, the rest length value. Uh, so don't don't uh, uh, don't worry about it. Basically, okay. So it's just for fun. 
do you have a tutorial about inflatable structures? Mm, no, but I have, uh, no, I just have some videos on YouTube showing some behaviors. Uh, there is the, the cushion, there is a mattress and, uh, and something like that. I, I don't remember exactly, but yeah, uh, you can take a look at that, but you won't see any, any detailed description. Um, what if these layers have different anchor points, more like separate layers with some stitches connecting them? Well, it, you can do it. Um, um, you can do it. For example, uh, I am using just one um, um, anchor point component here, which has four, four and four. Okay. So let's say that I want to, uh, let's say, change the anchor points for the, I don't know, upper mesh. Okay. So remember that there is no change in the order of data. So the upper mesh is the second mesh because the Z coordinate is one. So the, the second point is the upper point. The second plane is the upper plane. The second mesh is the upper mesh. Okay. So when we use, for example, uh, this um, mesh corner, the second um, branch of this tree corresponds to the upper mesh corners. So the upper mesh anchor points. So let's say I want to change the upper mesh anchor points. Okay. So what I'm going to do is basically I need to pass to the target four different anchor points. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to, oh, sorry, I went to run. I'm going to uh, explode the tree and I'm going to use the second branch. We only have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to hurry a little. And I'm going to, um, let's say, move this uh, second set of anchor point, okay, which is the upper, uh, in the, let's say, Z direction, just to keep it simple, with um, a slider between 0 and 10, okay? But I'm going to do this like four times because we have four corner points okay so in this moment i am actually moving uh, nothing okay so this is our um our uh, displaced point okay and then i want to um send them all together to this uh, to this anchor point here so i already split the tree exploded the tree so i might want to uh, plug the first set, which is not going to, to change, as well as the second set, which can change at this moment, because I can work with these sliders here. So if I run the simulation, I get this. My anchor points are actually at the same height because none of them is being moved. But if I take, for example, I, I guess that this would refer to this point here. So if I move this up and... Uh, Oh, sorry, my bad, my bad. Um, yes, I need to, I, I am wrong, sorry, rookie, rookie mistake. Uh, but anyway, uh, what I need to do is tell that these are anchor points, okay? While our target are the first set of points, which is not changing, and the second set of points, which is actually moving. So I must use this as target, rookie mistake, my bad. So if I turn on the, the simulation, and now I move, for example, the first point, we should see that there must be some point moving up. Okay, it's the lower right corner, it's not the lower left. But you see that now I am changing this, uh, this uh, uh, anchor point here. And I can also change the opposite one and eventually change the, the other, okay? So yes, you can, uh, you can use different anchor points. Of course, I am using two uh, identical layers in this case, which is basically leading to this uh, thing and also I have uh, very strong, very stiff uh, connection springs. So you see that is 50, the, their strength. So if I decrease this, the, the elastic net will be more capable of uh, connecting to uh, the anchor points, but it also will also fly away like this, okay? Uh, in this case, it would be interesting to uh, set some internal anchor point, but it's something that we don't have the time uh, today uh, to do this. I will leave it like this. So I will upload my uh, my definition also with this change here, this last change. Uh, so you will have it and you can play around with, uh, with it. Uh, how long does it take me to learn basics? Oh, uh, you're new to Grasshopper. I do recommend that you don't start with Kangaroo. 
um, just start with some uh, basic um, can uh, grasshopper uh, course or if, if you're into tutorial you might want to look for tutorial on on YouTube I do recommend that you don't take for granted that tutorials information is uh, is uh, valid many tutorials are just let's say well I, I don't mean to be rude but they are useless okay um, so just be careful with uh, the the tutorials you find there are uh, quite uh, very few uh, tutorials uh, that are worth the effort of, of wasting your time or you can take uh, courses as well. Um, so don't don't start with kangaroo. It, it, it's not it's not uh, a good approach. Uh, so I suggest you start from the basics. Uh, first of all, you understand very well how to work with uh, data manipulation inside Grasshopper, and then you start with basic things like, for example, attractors and paneling and this kind of uh, of things. And once you are you you know this kind of of uh, topics then you might switch to to kangaroo of course and other plugins as well um so i see there is no no further questions so um basically just as a reminder i'm going to share on my website and uh, on, on my social networks i i invite you to um to stay in contact um there is uh, my uh, facebook account is uh, basically you can find me like like uh, janka dm um, all my contacts are available on my website. So uh, if you go jankadm.com, uh, on the top uh, part of the window, you will find all the uh, um, connection, all the links to my uh, social, professional network, WhatsApp, and, and so on. So I do recommend that you um, uh, get in, stay in touch. Um, Really, always recommend to use Kangaroo Two or something is better. I love Kangaroo One. Well, actually, zero ninety nine um, because uh, I I told, uh, as I said in the first session, um, I think it's uh, it's well if if you are if you are well aware of, of what you want to do with uh, with Kangaroo in terms of physical simulation, I find Kangaroo zero ninety nine more intuitive in order to implement a uh, properly the physical system. Okay, so. Um, I was describing it into into the first uh, session of this tutorial, so you might want to take a look over there. But um, I would not recommend um, to use Kangaroo Two or One. It depends on what you want to do. Kangaroo Two is simpler, okay? Um, it's like a simplified version of Kangaroo Zero Ninety Nine, so it's it's easy it's easier to use it. So eventually, I would I would recommend to use Kangaroo Two. But if you want to do some very particular things, then you might want to switch back to Zero Ninety Nine. Thank you for being here. Uh, Angelica, where will you share the file? On YouTube, in the description of this second session. So I'm going to upload this uh, in a few hours. It should already be online. Uh, so you will find the link to, to this file, to the, to the script, Grasshopper script in the description. Uh, can you share? Morisa, okay, now I know who is MM. <laughs> Uh, the file here too. Uh, yes, to adopt it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, can you show the installation of it? For some reason, I can't install it. Well, you can go on my website. On my website, you will find uh, uh, a this. Uh, where is it? Okay, plugin install. Uh, there is a a full description of, on how to install any type of plugin. Okay, according to the type of plugin. So maybe you might want to uh, look at it. I'm going to copy paste this here so you can simply go and check the the link um and also uh sh share the file here too yes of course uh, actually i'm going oops i sorry my my bad i deleted it uh oh, okay so sorry about that but uh, it's it's incomplete the file that i have right now it's incomplete okay so um you will find it on on uh, on youtube okay or you can get in touch uh through my website or facebook or whatever Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ankita. Okay, guys. So, well, I hope to see you uh, uh, with the, inside the the heteropter webinar. I'm going to publish the date on on my website and my social uh, network. So, stay at home and and be safe. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>